so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to start by um, introducing our esteemed panel. Um, so Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar is a humanitarian teacher, peacemaker. Um, the amount of uh, amazing things he has done around the world is uh, quite astounding, from developing programs for youth, for college students, for veterans, for prisoners, uh, for trauma relief, and the list goes on. He also is engaged in so much peacemaking around the world, um, including currently a really powerful effort to help refugees. Um, coming out of Ukraine and landing in Poland and other places through his organization. He has received 22 honorary doctorates from around the, or universities around the world, um, as well as uh, over 40 governmental awards. So um, welcome, Gurudev. It's really an honor to have you here. Next, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Dr. Morty, who needs no introduction, um, our U.S. Surgeon General. Um, he was confirmed by the U.S. Senate in March 2021 to serve as 21st Surgeon General, but also served as 19th. Um, and uh, as the nation's doctor, his mission is to restore trust by relying on the best scientific information available. And he's had a particular interest in social connection over the years um, that we've heard about, that we've read about, and it's just been um, so such an important predictor of, of health, and one of the things we're going to be discussing today. So welcome, Dr. Morty. It's an honor to you. And Dr. James Doty, founder and director of the Stanford University Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. Dr. Doty is um, a neurosurgeon by professor, uh, but also a neuroscientist. He is also an inventor, a philanthropist, and the, uh, the author of the New York Times bestselling book, into the Magic Shop, and also the Handbook of Compassion Science, among many other things. The list goes on. So welcome, Dr. Dodi. So the topic of social connection has become most relevant in the last couple of years of um, increased loneliness. But even before the pandemic, we knew there was already an epidemic of loneliness. We know that around the world. In fact, the UK um, created a ministry for loneliness because social connection has such a direct impact on our physical health, our psychological health, and our longevity. In fact, lack of social connection is worse for you than obesity, smoking, high blood pressure in terms of its impact on longevity. And in the last two years, um, the, the, the increased loneliness has really been brought to all of our attention and experience. So um, it, it couldn't be a better time to talk about that. And of course, its impact uh, on mental health, both in adults and especially in our youth, which is what we really are, um, care about so much today. In fact, um, I just read a, a study before coming in, a recent study from the CDC showing that uh, from 2009 to 2021, American high school students who say they feel persistent feelings of sadness and helplessness rose from 26% to 44%. If you really let that sink in for a moment. Um, so looking forward to our, our conversation. So let's start on a, a personal note here. So um, Guru Dev, you have had tremendous success sort of fostering belongingness um, in, uh, around the world, including in, uh, with militants and guerrilla warfare. Um, in particular, you worked with the FARC in Colombia. Hezbollah militants relinquished their arms after your programs. Um, and you lay out a blueprint for peace in um, Ayodhya, India, and more in South America, and so forth. So what inspired you to go to such dangerous places of conflict and create a greater sense of belonging. And how did you do that? See, if you see through my eyes, I don't see any bad people per se on earth. If the people whom we call as culprits of heinous crimes, there is a victim crying for help inside of them. If you reach out to them and heal them, the culprit disappears. Yeah. So it's like, a rebellious child will never be uh, abandoned by the mother. She just sees how the child could be, uh, you know, brought back to the normal behavior. I feel the same thing, uh, you know, when people are sick, we, they, we send them to hospital. Their actions are sick, we send them to jail. But when they go to jail, we don't correct their, don't give them tools and techniques to correct their behavior correct the way they feel. You know, the sense of loneliness, what you are just mentioning, I would say um, it's because that we have not 
learned how to be with ourselves, how to be in peace with ourselves. And if we can learn to be with ourselves, we will be joy for everyone around us. Um, Dr. Morty, what first got you so interested in this topic of social connection from a personal stand? Well, I, I got interested in the topic in, in several stages, but one of them was actually in 2015 when I had started my first term as Surgeon General. And I was traveling around the country asking people a very simple question, which is, how can I help? And I would try to sit back and just listen to their stories. So people told me stories about all kinds of experiences they were having, but the unexpected stories I was hearing again and again were actually stories of loneliness and disconnection, uh, with people saying that they felt like they were carrying a lot of burdens in their life by themselves. Uh, many young people on college campuses that I would meet said that they, yes, were surrounded by hundreds or thousands of classmates, but they felt invisible as they moved through the world. They felt like if they disappeared tomorrow, it wouldn't matter. Uh, so that is one of the things that got me interested in it. As I dug more into uh, the research, there are several things that I realized. One is that loneliness is incredibly common, uh, that there are more people who struggle with loneliness in our country, more adults, uh, than actually have diabetes. Uh, I also noticed that there were people who, uh, while we typically have this stereotype in our head of who is lonely, we think of the person maybe toward the later years of their life who may be living alone, you know, without family, or the person who's in a, you know, sitting in the corner of a room by himself or herself at a party. But that's actually not the picture of loneliness. I met many people who were CEOs, who were members of Congress, who were parents, you know, living busy lives, so people who were surrounded by lots of other folks, but who felt profoundly disconnected from others and alone. And then there was the health consequence of that, which is that it wasn't just a bad feeling, but it was associated with a greater risk of anxiety and depression, but also heart disease, premature death, and other physical ailments. Um, and lastly, I say that what this reminded me of also these stories I was hearing from people were my own personal experiences, where as a child I had struggled a lot with loneliness, and I was very shy as a child, and I, I wanted to hang out with other kids and make friends and, and play, but I just felt inhibited you know, at, at doing so. And, and that's actually the reason I felt scared to go to school every day. It wasn't because I was worried about exams or scared about my teachers. I was worried about walking into the cafeteria at noon and being scared that there'd be nobody to sit next to. Um, or being on the playground and having no one to play with. Now, at the time, I felt this profound sense of shame around that. For the fact that if I was feeling lonely, it probably meant that something was wrong with me, that I was doing something wrong, that I didn't have social skills, or, or worse of all, that I wasn't likable in some way. And what I didn't know at that time is that I wasn't the only one feeling that, but it felt like that at the time. And the sense of shame was so intense that even though I knew that my mother and father loved me unconditionally, even though I never had any doubt about that, I never felt like I could tell them because I felt this profound sense of shame. And I saw that shame mirrored in the stories and the faces of the patients I cared for years later as a doctor. You know, I never took a course on loneliness or isolation in medical school. It wasn't part of our training. Um, but from the day I set foot in the hospital as a third year medical student, there it was, you know, patients who would come in by themselves. So when I would ask them, is there somebody I can call you know, during, for this difficult conversation we're about to have about a new diagnosis or a tough treatment decision we have to make, so often they would say to me, you know, I wish there was somebody, but there isn't, so I'll just have the conversation alone. So th these were all part of what I was thinking about when I was having those conversations as Surgeon General. And it led me to understand that my experiences weren't isolated. Uh, what I was seeing as a doctor weren't unique to my experience. There was something deeper happening uh, in America and around the world where people were increasingly disconnected from each other, but also disconnected from themselves, questioning their own sense of self-worth, uncomfortable, if you will, to even be alone by themselves for fear of the thoughts and, uh, you know, and other concerns that may arise in their mind. So that is why, to me, now it has become so important that we, that we go from what I think of as a social recession, a time where we have retreated from our relationships where we have diminished in terms of the richness of our connection with one, with one another. And we figure out how to engineer and build a social revival in our country and around the world where people can enjoy that deeper connection with themselves and others and recognize that that connection that we share with others is the foundation on which we build everything else, good health, uh, good schools and workplaces, and a society that truly functions well. Beautifully put.
Dr. Doty, you've made it your life's mission to spread the signs of compassion, uh, training on compassion, you know, through your writings, through your research, through your centers. Uh, please, can you share from your perspective sort of the, the personal um, story behind your, um, your impulse to do that, to, to do, share that with the world? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I actually grew up in poverty. My father uh, actually was an alcoholic. My mother uh, had a stroke when I was a child and was partially paralyzed. And uh, <clears throat> in that situation, of course, <clears throat> you don't really have resources. Uh, and uh, that in and of itself creates isolation. Plus, uh, the reality is that if you're, <clears throat> and I, it, it somewhat mirrors Dr. Murthy's uh, statement, you know, you think you're the only one with this issue, right? Uh, that you're the only one suffering, you're the only one who has uh, these types of issues. But of course, as a child, you don't appreciate that and you think you're the only one who's suffering. And as a result, you have a sense of hopelessness, loneliness, despair. And in my case, it wasn't that my parents didn't love me, it was <clears throat> they were so enmeshed in their own problems that they didn't have time to deal with my situation. Uh, so what magically happened for me was uh, I actually walked into a magic shop, believe it or not. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, I'm so excited to hear where this goes. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and what happened was I had an interest in magic, but uh, 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 the owner wasn't there, but his mother was there. And she knew nothing about magic, but what she did know was about people. And uh, I had a sense of shame, uh, embarrassment, <clears throat> uh, again, a sense of hopelessness, and which, of course, are the f foundations for uh, depression. Um, but here was this woman who met me with this radiant smile. And you know, this is interesting because one person can have a huge, huge impact, and that's what we forget. And this woman uh, fundamentally embraced me. And she did not treat me, this, I was 12 years old, she did not treat me like a 12 year old. She did not judge me. And you know, this is one of the problems. So many people are terrified of being judged and they're fearful of that. And so I felt very comfortable with her. And to make a long story short, uh, and probably because she was feeding me chocolate chip cookies, uh, <laughs> which I've continued. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, after a while, she said to me, she said, you know, I really like you. If you come every day, I think I can teach you something that could really help you. And what I did not realize, and this relates very much to our conversation, is I had come from a chaotic background. I never knew what was going to happen. And as a result, I was always tense. I was always anxious. I was always afraid. And when you're in that situation, you can't focus. You can't attend. So the first thing she taught me was actually a relaxation technique and a breathing technique. And to be frank with you, as a 12-year-old, I thought she was nuts, but, <laughs> but, but I did what she asked. <laughs> as long as the chocolate chips kept coming. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I actually embraced that. And after a few weeks, I, I, it really changed my outlook. And then what I didn't realize, and I think Many of you may have experienced this. We have a dialogue going on in our head. And it's not a positive dialogue. It's a dialogue that says, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I don't deserve love. I'm an imposter. Have any of you ever had that experience? <laughs> if you don't raise your head, you're not being honest. <laughs> uh, so anyway, she made me realize that. And then she taught me a technique of self-affirmation and acceptance which changed the narrative. It changed the channel from one of being hypercritical to one of being kind to myself and loving myself. And once you change that, what you don't appreciate, though, is you see the world through a different lens. Because you see, when you're hypercritical with yourself, when you're beating yourself up, then the world looks bad. Everybody has a problem. And when you change that narrative, you recognize not only your own suffering, but the reality that everyone is suffering. And when you do that, you are much more gentle, you're much more kind, you're much more accepting, because you realize that none of us are perfect. But so many people get into their head, especially with social media. I mean, I think they did a survey of high school students, and a, a significant number want to be influencers. 
Well, the thing about an influencer, they give this false image that they're perfect. And so then people try to strive to be perfect, but none of us are perfect. And then this creates this ongoing uh, negative dialogue, which only worsens the situation and, of course, creates uh, mental health issues. So I think that understanding that everyone deserves kindness, everyone deserves compassion, everyone is carrying their own burden, actually changes everything. And it also, again, this experience with this woman, my own experience is that every one of us has the capacity to improve one person's life every day, period. And you don't have to be rich, you don't have to be powerful, you have to be kind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Debbie. And it's, it's such an honor to be sitting with three so kind, such kind uh, speakers here today. And um, so, D Dr. Marti, um, we're going to shift gears and uh, think about how we can improve sort of this loneliness problem that, that we're, is going on in society. And we'd love to know, you've made this a central part of your initiatives. What are some of the uh, initiatives that, that have worked? What are some of the, the, the things you have implemented that you've seen work towards building a greater sense of social connection and belonging? Hmm. Well, you know, you know, sometimes when we see big problems in society, sometimes our knee jerk can be, well, we need to pass a law to solve that, or you know, or get hundreds of millions of billions of dollars, you know, to to address that issue. And sometimes that's the case, but I don't think that that alone uh, will solve our problems with disconnection. I think there's something deeper that we have to reflect on and address, like in our, you know, in our lives, uh, you know, in sort of the modern in the, the culture of the modern world, you know, which. And, and ask ourselves, are we living the life that we really want to live? Are we valuing the things that are really valuable? And the pandemic, I think, has given us a chance to step back and do that deeper reflection. And something I find encouraging and perhaps a, a silver lining in what has been a very, very painful, painful couple of years with this pandemic has been that I think there are more people who are at, looking at their lives and are saying, what do I really want uh, out of my life? What do I really want my kid's life to look like? What do I really want society? Uh, to look like. And my hope is that we can make the shift from being a largely work-centered uh, society, uh, a society, a society that has largely told younger generations that success is equated with your ability to acquire wealth, power, or fame, uh, and shift instead to, uh, to what I think history and evolution have told us uh, is really what gives us happiness and fulfillment, which is a deep sense of connection to ourselves and to others, a life that is truly centered around people uh, and service, and one where we understand that our worth as human beings is not extrinsic. It's not based on the money, power, fame, but it's intrinsic. It's based on our ability to give and to receive love freely. And the more we're able to do that, it turns out often the more fulfilled we are. Now, with the, from the programs that have inspired me the most uh, that are helping cultivate this around the, the country are, are programs where people are actually stepping up to serve one another. Uh, I think about, for example, uh, the Beyond Differences program and that started in California, a school-based program that now is spread to schools across the country, where high school students have taken it upon themselves to help middle school students uh, who are struggling with loneliness. Uh, they train them to be mentors, to train them to be guides who go out there and to look and see who might be on their own, who might be isolated, and to in kind gentle ways, bring them in to the fold, include them in conversation, enable them to participate in activities. Uh, you know, I wish there were such a program when I was a child, you know, uh, around, but that is a very powerful one. There's another one that I, I remember visiting in Chicago a few years ago called the Becoming a Man program, uh, a very powerful uh, program which is helping create a community uh, of trusted uh, young people who can help one another. And this, is, this program is fascinating because it was studied by the University of Chicago Crime Lab. Uh, and what they, they found is that this program, which essentially brings, uh, at that time it brought young men uh, together who are in high school, uh, together about once a week with a mentor who would facilitate conversation, help them get to know one another. And over time they came to rely on one another because they built trust uh, with each other. And what they found is that, that program uh, you know, in just a short time, was able to reduce, uh, you know, sort of encounters with, with law enforcement and, uh, and violent arrests by somewhere around the neighborhood of 50%. Um, and this is, again, not a program that had special medicine, special technology that was employed in it. This was good old-fashioned human relationships 
uh, coming to play to help people heal. Uh, and that program now, is, they have a, a similar program uh, for, for, for young girls, uh, young women. Uh, they've expanded the program to Boston and to other cities. But I just shared these as two examples of what can happen when we, in our own communities, in our own settings, look around and ask the question, what can we do to deepen our connection with one another, to get to know one another? Because that, I think, is one of the crises of today, is that people don't know each other. And when we don't know one another, it is easier to demonize someone else. It's easier to throw stones at them, especially if you're doing it on social media where you don't have to see the pain in their face up close. Um, so the question is, how do we get to know one another again? It's why I think actually the idea of, of service, uh, not just voluntary service, but even thinking about like, you know, as a country, should we have uh, you know, a, a service requirement uh, where individuals can uh, serve in inner cities or in other parts of the country with folks who come from around the country? Um, our military does this. It brings individuals together from around the country. And they forge often lifelong powerful bonds. Um, I think we can do that um, with non-military public service as well. Uh, but we need to find ways uh, for people to come together and know one another, because that, I find, is when true healing starts to happen. Beautiful. Thank you. So, Gurudev, one of the most fascinating aspects um, that I, I find about social connection research is that um, the, the data shows that the benefits of social connection have nothing to do with how many people are in your social circle. They have everything to do with your subjective sense of connection. So you, that's why you can feel lonely in a crowd or you can be by yourself in your apartment and feel complete belongingness. And so you have often talked about the fact that connection starts from within. Could you please expand on that? Yeah. Uh, I would like to narrate a story. Once uh, a gentleman got sick and so he went to a doctor. And the doctor checked him. He did thorough checking, scanning and everything. He said, hey, nothing wrong with you, man. You simply have to laugh more. <laughs> so he said, do one thing. There is a circus happening around. There is a buffoon. And here is a ticket. I was about to go. I can give you. You go and um, enjoy the show and, <laughs> and laugh there and you'll be fine. And the gentleman said, sir, I am that buffoon. <laughs> <laughs> so I make everybody laugh, but something bothering inside of me. See, neither at home nor in school are we taught how to handle our emotions. It's normal to feel left out. It's normal to feel lonely at some time. You know, loneliness is not only for some people, even those who have Riches, those who have good family connection, have girlfriend, boyfriend, in spite of having a very happy family, still people feel lonely. Still people get depressed. Why? Because we have not learned to know about our own mind, our own emotions, and how each emotion creates certain sensation in certain part of the body. If you observe, emotions are to do with certain endocrine glands. And they create certain palpitation or certain vibration, certain sensation in parts of the body. Now, this also is linked to a rhythm in the breath. So if we know something about our breath, then we can manage our emotions so well. Now you feel angry, you feel frustrated, you feel jealous, but you don't know what to do with those emotions. And we hold on to it. But you know, kids, they don't. Mm -hmm. Kids are crying for a moment. Next, it doesn't take them a few seconds uh, back to laugh or come back to their normal self again. But as we grow older, we seem to forget there is a delete button mm -hmm. in our computer. We don't use that at all. So we keep overwriting things. And here, our breath has a message for all of us. Say, hey, look. I'm here flowing in and out of you, day and night. Why don't you give me a little bit attention? You know, if you give me attention, I'll make you happy. <laughs> I'll keep you happy. I'll keep, up, keep your spirit uplifted, your energy uplifted. And <coughs> this is the message that we need to, um, you know, get out of this, <coughs> be aware of this. And have to, uh, I have seen this happening. Millions around the world have, learn some breathing techniques and sky breathing techniques, that's why we call sky. 
Technique sky is the limit for your energy. You know, you can feel very vibrant. You can get over the despondency, the hopelessness. All these emotions, feelings can be under your control rather than you feeling a victim of your own mind. You can be master of your own mind. You can have a say. And that is where I say the loneliness or uh, anger or sometimes hatred. You know, people, when they get uh, this feeling of hatred in their mind, days together they cannot sleep. They cannot have good sleep. Then it causes fear, then the anxiety. All these emotions can be handled by handling our own breath. The breath has that secret. Along with breathing technique, few minutes of meditation does it. You know, like Doti has already mentioned how few minutes of uh, aphorisms and deep breathing and meditation does it. It does has an impact uh, on all sections of society and in all age groups. This is something that we can note. See, if we observe a baby and the way the baby expresses emotions and the way baby breathes and how he bounces back to its, uh, um, you know, normal self. You don't need any teacher. The baby is your teacher. <laughs> the baby does all the yoga exercise. If you see, <laughs> it does the cobra pose and then it holds on to the knee and then turns left and right and, you know. Nature has so much uh, lessons waiting for us. We only have to pick it up. And that we can do when we keep pressing the delete button. <laughs> you know. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Doty, you have um, created some compassion cultivation programs and um, just would love to hear your perspective on how compassion can increase our sense of social connection and mental health, for that matter. Sure. Well, uh, one of the things uh, I mentioned earlier, and I think our, my colleagues have, is uh, the nature of fear. And fear separates us. And uh, unfortunately, as humans, uh, one of our survival mechanisms is to respond to threat. And threat then stimulates your sympathetic nervous system. Then you shut down. And you're actually separated because you're trying to survive. And, uh, um, and that's part of the problem. When you um, <clears throat> are compassionate, in some ways, it can have the same effect as a breathing exercise, or actually the opposite can occur. But when you're compassionate, that actually opens things up. You're no longer separated. You look at the other uh, as yourself. You look at you being together in something. And of course, that's the fundamental nature of human connection. And so narratives that are created to spark fear which we're very attuned to. You don't see any news programs that talk about happiness and joy, right? <laughs> They're all about <laughs> fear-based because that gets our attention. That's how we evolved as a species. So I think learning to overcome these narratives, you know, there's a, a quote that's attributed to Viktor Frankl. He did not say this quote, though, but everybody says he said this quote. And the reason is because I always look up quotes, but that's a different story. Anyway, he says before stimulus and response, there is a pause. In that pause lies your freedom. And so our natural inclination is to respond to events where we immediately uh, put up our defenses. We immediately try to protect ourselves. But oftentimes, we're wrong about the motivation of other people. You see, we don't know what's going on in somebody's head, so we make assumptions. As an example, I had a colleague who uh, I worked with. He was a young physician. and uh, he and I were working on a project, and we'd meet every couple of weeks. And one time he shows up in my office, and he's extraordinarily aggressive, which is completely unlike him. And it turns out what happened was that uh, he was changing jobs. And unfortunately, in the United States, you don't get health insurance, so he had to do something called COBRA, right, which is this gap insurance. Well, because he was young, and with two kids, everybody was healthy, he didn't get the COBRA insurance. Well, it turned out that this aggressiveness had nothing to do with our conversation. It had to do with the fact that his wife had found a lump on her breast and had a biopsy, and it was cancer, you see? 
So the issue had nothing at all to do with me, yet we make these assumptions about people. Now, to complete that story, fortunately, we were able to go back, get his Cobra insurance. Wife had her biopsy. She didn't need any further therapy, and she was fine. But my point is this fear that can grow inside of you that limits your perspective, you see. So when you apply compassion, when you look through that lens, everything changes. And this is the fundamental nature of social connection. It's trust. It's being kind. It's looking at the other person as yourself. And if you look at the other person as yourself, you cannot not be kind, right? I mean, it's really uh, that simple. So I think uh, the development of these different techniques for cultivating compassion, one is a breathing exercise. You naturally go there. These types of practice are hugely, hugely profound because, you know, a person who becomes an Olympic athlete, it's a combination of their genetic makeup and them being involved in that sport. That's how they excel. It's not because, as an example, I or some of you are not going to become marathon runners who win races because we're not genetically programmed that way or we eat too many chocolate chip cookies. Uh, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but the thing, my point is, though, all of us have a capacity, though, to increase our ability to be kind and compassionate. And when you do that, your physiology completely changes. You shift from engagement of your sympathetic nervous system to engagement of your parasympathetic nervous system, which is huge. Your heart rate slows down. Your heart rate variability increases. Your immune system is boosted. The production of inflammatory proteins is markedly decreased. And this is why Dr. Murthy was saying that uh, you know, when you sort of get into this mindset, when you're kind, uh, it changes things because when you're not there, it promotes inflammation, which is the basis of most diseases. So being kind, being compassionate, being thoughtful has a huge, huge positive impact. So by developing these techniques, actually that changes everything. And again, imagine what it's like for your mother to hold you, right? how good that feels. To, to be accepted unconditionally right? No judgment. The power of that is so amazing. You feel warm. You feel gentleness. You feel kindness. And if that is your goal in the world, if you will, to offer that to other people, everything changes. And again, it's within our capacity to do that. Everybody has that ability. You're simply limited by your own fears. Yet you are the agent you know, a lot of us think there's some external force that's responsible for everything. Everything comes from right here, and it's your choice. And when you're able to overcome that fear, it actually unleashes incredible power within each and every one of you. So never let anybody tell you it's not possible. It is possible. It's just within you to believe it's possible. Absolutely. Beautiful. Um, Gurudev, you've developed specific programs for youth. So um, some of the research that we conducted at Yale showed that your program um, improved mental health and well-being, but also social connection above and beyond other programs. And then I was um, speaking with your Sky Schools t uh, team, and they mentioned that the, the schools program also is having immense benefit for belonging. Um, and one example they gave me was that at Eastside High in Newark, New Jersey, there was a 90 percent decrease in violent incidents in at-risk students. I mean, those are, that's a huge percentage. Um, so could you explain how it is that your SKY programs lead to not only greater well-being, but also that sense of social connection? And then perhaps if you would grace us with a meditation or an exercise, that would be wonderful. <laughs> It does, but we don't know how it does, why it does. <laughs> Perhaps, see, um, see, the normal nature of uh, every individual is kindness, loving, compassionate, and joyful. See, no child cries for uh, no reason. It, when they cry, there is a reason for it. Either they're scared, they're hungry, they want to sleep, they don't know how to fall asleep. Some, for some reason only they cry. 
Similarly, if someone is violent, there must be a reason behind their being violent. If someone is not compassionate, there is a reason for it. And if you really ponder on what is the reason, go deep into the roots of it, you'll find isolation. Isolation, fear, that lack of sense of belongingness. Sense of rejection, which Dr. Murthy has already said. A fear of being rejected. And then wanting to be perfect. No, I am asking because why do you have to be perfect? Tell me. <laughs> why do we have to run towards to be so perfect? In this run, I want to be perfect, we become imperfect. I would say just relax. Know that, you know, when you are relaxed, what comes out of you is perfection. When you are natural, <laughs> what comes of out of you is compassion. You can't but be compassionate. Anyone who is in their senses can't but be loving, caring. You see? The hardness that uh, envelops us or dawns on us is because of stress. See, any kind person, if you don't let them sleep for a couple of days and then give him a lot of job on top of it, you know, he'll be he will irritate you, he or she. They become irritable. <laughs> so we forget that uh, our emotions are to do with our stress level and vice versa, of course. But we need to teach people how to get rid of the stress. You know, grandmothers used to say, oh, if you are angry, go to a corner and count ten. Now not ten, even hundred you count, there is not coming down. Those days are gone, you know. Those days when the kids were much more innocent and then you go to a corner, okay, count and perhaps you have faith in what grandmother says, it will work and it used to work. But today, just counting doesn't work. I've been mean, doing things, more things stress you more. So we need to know how to let go and relax and say, you are okay the way you are now. That's the first step. Then we'll see that we rise from one perfection to another perfection. Instead of saying, I'm going from imperfection to perfection, I would say, we are in one level of perfection, but then you can rise to another level of perfection. Move people in that direction that instills them with confidence. It protects their compassion inside of them. It gives them more uh, sense of belongingness with everybody around. So much, Gurudev. We, we are at time, but couldn't we listen to these three all day? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'd love to just ask for just some, some last words. Would that be all right with everyone? Yeah? Um, you know, especially when we think of youth and uh, youth mental health. I mean, who is the youth? It's, it's school children, it's teenagers, it's college students, but it's also active service members. So we know the brain, the prefrontal cortex doesn't fully mature until we're 25 years old. Um, so, in, you know, in a very short amount of time, maybe the three of you could just share some, some last tools or practices that you think we could um, impart to the younger members of our community. Uh, Dr. Dodi, would you like to start? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think it gets back to this point that uh, in some ways um, we are not alone. It's just we don't know we're not alone. And I think that just taking the time to look around you and appreciate that there are people who care about you. You know, people get lost in this narrative oftentimes that no one cares, I'm alone. And, you know, they create a permanent solution, sadly, for a temporary problem. And uh, because almost all things pass, uh, it's just at the time you don't think about it. And I think that uh, taking the time to look around and making an effort uh, it's so easy to keep looking at your device, but uh, I think all of us, if we see somebody alone, we make the time to connect with somebody. We make sure that they know that they're appreciated, and we protect them from every bad thing that happens in the world. Part of our problem oftentimes for parents is they want to make this world a perfect place for their children, so they protect them from any of the bad stuff, but the, re the reality of life is bad stuff is going to happen. That is the nature of life. And so having them experience 
uh, situations where they have to overcome, having them learn how to manage versus protecting them so much oftentimes so anytime there's, they stumble, they don't know what to do. So I think it's really important that as parents, uh, we're supportive, we don't protect them, but the other important thing is that we don't create situations where they're overwhelmed. I mean, I'm sure some of you know parents who put these incredible demands on their children. And of course, you always say, well, that's not me. Well, it is you. <laughs> and, and as Sri Sri said, you know, we're here in this world a very limited period of time. We don't have to uh, be perfect. And frankly, we're perfect as we are, and that means we're imperfect. And that is reality. So when you teach a child to have resilience, when you teach a child that everything is not going to go their way, when you teach a child that I am there for you if you need me, but that I am not here to solve every problem for you. And I think those are very important things. So much, Dr. Brady. We teach kids dental hygiene. Like that we need to teach them mental hygiene. <laughs> mental hygiene is making them realize they can do some breathing in the morning, five, 10 minutes, especially if they are off their mood. They can get back to their cheerful mood, doing a little bit of breathing technique, five, five minutes, 10 minutes a day. Now and then, acceptance, accept people, as Dr. Doty has already mentioned, accept people's situation as they are. See the present moment is inevitable. Second is live in the present moment. Don't go on cribbing about the past and being anxious about the future. We, uh, we all the time oscillate. You know, if you are given 10 compliments and one insult, we hold on to that one insult and one negative thing and leave aside all the 20 good things that is around us. So giving that orientation to our students from getting into a negative spin to something that is positive, seeing something positive. One negative thing in, for in every 10 positive is inevitable. And this wisdom, we need to bring it to them. You know, That's what we do in the sky uh, programs. We give them an idea and, uh, you know, and open their minds up to the reality. Look at your mind, you know, what it does. You know, what, what are you hanging on to? See? And then whenever you feel, oh, uh, this, the heaven is falling on your head, look, this is not the first time you're facing a problem. You have had that last year, two years back, 10 years back. You learn from your own experience. Put your attention to your own life. And then you will say, hey, this will pass. I can get over this mm -hmm. as easily as, as I could the last exams when I was nervous. See, that type of... And then... It's so alarming, so painful to see so many young people are committing suicide. 60, 600 students committed suicide here in this country. It's unbelievable. Seeing in India also, we face this in IITs and those reputed institutions. Indian Institute of Science is the most reputed, world reputed institution. There, youths were committing suicide. In the, you know what they did in the hostel room? They removed all the fans, ceiling fans. I said, this is not going to help. <laughs> Removing the ceiling fan because in one month, six students, uh, you know, hang themselves up. They'll find some other place to hang themselves. We need to give them this education of mental hygiene, how to keep yourself cheerful, how to be a bubbling joy, or a fountain of joy and enthusiasm for yourself and for others. And the third thing is I would say, there is a joy in getting, which is an infant joy. Every baby knows on the Christmas Eve or on holidays when they get gift and they open it and there is such a joy in them. But there is a joy in giving, in contribution, which is mature and which is 10 times greater than the joy that you get in getting. So. We need to make them aware of this, involve our youths in any service project. Be part of Red Cross, be part of uh, service projects. We do Art of Living, many projects we do. And there are community service that's happening 
if kids get involved in any of these action oriented expression of compassion i tell you they feel much much better so these are some of the things i would say um, we need to bring to them thank you so much dr mochi any parting words for us on this topic sure well i i think there's a You'll find a lot of shared sentiment, I think, within Dr. Dodi said and Gurudev. And, and what I'll share, too, I think sometimes about the fact that the, one of the most important safety nets we have uh, are our relationships with one another. During times of stress, those relationships help buffer that stress and sustain us. So I think to build a truly people-centered life, we need people practices like in, in our life. And I think of three simple ones. One is to give our time, our attention, and our service to others. And this can all be done within five minutes in a, in a single day, right? Uh, to give time is to, to make time. We make time to do certain things every day, to brush our teeth as, as an example, uh, to eat our meals. Um, but to take five minutes uh, to reach out every day to somebody that you care about, uh, it could be calling them on the phone, it could be visiting them, it could be uh, video conferencing with them. So give that five minutes of your time and then give during those five minutes your attention. Right? So often the time we do spend with others is diluted uh, by the devices we hold in our hand. And I've certainly been guilty many times of being on the, fo you know, on the call, you know, call, call with somebody and then somehow, I don't know how it happens, all of a sudden I'm checking ESPN.com on my phone. Right? Like these things happen. Right? or refreshing my inbox, or looking something up on, on the news. And you know, we're all guilty of that, and we don't do that because we're bad people. We do that often because these devices are designed to, to pull us in. So sometimes it takes some extra intention uh, on our side uh, to make sure that five minutes counts. And I will tell you one thing I've realized over time is when you give your full attention to another human being, it has the effect of stretching time. It makes five minutes feel like half an hour. Uh, and if you've ever had the experience where you've been in conversation with somebody who's fully present with you, uh, who's giving their, their full self uh, uh, to you in that conversation, you know just how beautiful it can feel. And finally, uh, to, you know, there's your time, your attention, and to give your service. Um, we are so many ways we can serve uh, in this world, um, but there are also very simple ways that we can serve the people around us. You know, when we check on a friend who may be struggling, uh, when we simply ask them how they're doing and then pause to listen, um, that is in its own way uh, an act of service. Uh, when we have a coworker who may be struggling, or maybe we take five minutes at the end of the day to just swing by their cubicle, ask them how they're doing. And that's another way uh, that we serve as well. Uh, there are many ways to serve, but in five minutes we can accomplish all of these things. And it can often lead us, leave us feeling good for hours and sometimes for days, because as human beings, we are hardwired to connect with one another. Uh, when we are in connection with others, with ourselves, that's when we feel we are home. And that's what I feel like we're, that's the challenge that we're dealing with right now in modern society, is we are trying not to transform our lives into something utterly different than what it's supposed to be. We are trying to become who we've always been, who we've evolved to be over thousands of years, which are beings who are deeply connected to ourselves and one another. That is why I look at this as our journey to come back home. Um, if we do that, uh, then I think we will find deeper fulfillment and it turns out better physical and mental health as well. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for making us all feel very much at home, am I right? Um, and I want to also to thank um, Dr. Vyas uh, for her uh, kind generosity of hosting this conversation here. And thank you to George Washington University and the Milken School of Public Health. So many thanks to you, Dr. Vyas. Thank you. Thank you. I, will, I would like to once again thank our panelists, but also to thank all of you for being here with us today. I know that I feel more joyful. After the last hour, I feel imperfectly perfect. <laughs> After the last hour, and I feel inspired by so many young people who spent their time here today to listen and to learn. And that gives me great hope that we will build a better and brighter future. 
here and around the world. So thank you, everybody. Um, I think we've got a few gifts that we would just like to, uh, as a token of our appreciation. <laughs> for your patience for a few minutes um, as our panelists are escorted out. Uh, but before that, um, Dr. Murthy has graciously agreed to take some photos with members of our audience. So if there's anyone who would like to take photos, I'm sure there's many of you here, we're going to ask that you line up over on that side.